In the realm of films we watched as children that traumatized us, there's a lot to choose from. Gremlins, Coraline, Watership Down, Pinocchio, apparently. Gotta be honest, I don't really get that one. Apparently Who Framed Roger Rabbit is one too. I can see the potential there, but I think I was old enough by the time I first watched it that I avoided all of that. Of course, Land Before Time, Bambi, and The Lion King all had potential for emotional scarring. So I decided this glorious Halloween season to go back to one that left a real impact on me and see what's the deal. On the whole, in this department, I got off pretty easy. I only really have two films that stuck with me properly. Coraline almost got me. I started watching it as an in-flight movie when I was a few days shy of seven years old, but I decided right around the time shit started going properly weird that I couldn't continue and turned it off. I distinctly remember my dad praising my maturity for being able to make that assessment for myself. It's one of the only times I can remember him giving me actual positive feedback. So in picking the movie for this video, I really only had two options, which actually means I had one, because of those two movies, one of them is Watership Down, a movie that scarred me so badly that I to this day have absolutely no wish to engage with anything related to it ever again, thank you very much. So that leaves me with a little-known movie from the 80s called The Secret of Nim, directed, of course, by Don Bluth. It was his directorial debut, actually, a fact I did not know until I looked it up on Wikipedia. Now, this movie... it shook me. I don't remember how old I was exactly when I watched it, but I can't have been super young, because I remember after the credits rolled and I'd run out of the room, my mom hugged me and I was at least chest height to her then. And the funny thing is, I have not watched it once in the years since. But somehow, my perspective on it has completely shifted. I don't remember much of it, I'm not sure why it shook me so badly, but I do know that I think it's a good movie. So, without further ado, I have a movie to go watch and some opinions to give. Alright, I'm back. My first thought on watching this movie is, I was right, it's a good one. No idea how I came to that conclusion given my only previous experience of it, but there you are. It tells the tale of Mrs. Brisby, a recently widowed mouse living in a cinder block out in a farmer's field. When it comes time for the farmer to start up the plow and all the critters in the field to get out of Dodge, her son Timmy is sick with pneumonia. He can't go outside or the chill in the air might kill him, so she can't move him. Desperate to find a way to save him, she goes to the great owl to ask for advice. At first he tells her to buzz off, but upon finding out who she is, and more importantly, who her late husband was, he tells her to go find the rats who live in the rosebush near the farmhouse and ask for Nicodemus. In the rosebush, she finds out that her husband escaped a lab belonging to the National Institute of Mental Health, aka NIM, <laughs> with the rats and another mouse named Mr. Ages. Jonathan was the reason they all got out in the end, and he died in a mission to drug the farmer's cat, Dragon. She also receives an amulet that Jonathan apparently wanted her to have, as well as a speech about courage of the heart, which will become relevant later. Because she is the wife of Jonathan Brisby, the rats agree to move her house to the safe side of the stone, where it won't be in the way of the plow. See, these rats are far more intelligent than your average rodent, due to the cruel experimentation they were subjected to. They also have significantly longer lifespans. They've been stealing electricity from the farmer, they can read, and they're able to rig up a whole complex machine of rope and pulleys to move the house. First, though, they have to make sure the farmer's cat won't notice them, so Mrs. Brisby volunteers to drug his supper, the same mission that her husband died on. <laughs> and she actually succeeds, but ends up being captured by the farmer's son who wants to keep her. Which actually turns out to be lucky, because that way she manages to overhear a conversation between the farmer and someone calling from Nim, talking about some people from Nim coming out and either exterminating or recapturing the rats, I'm not entirely clear on which one. But, of course, there is a villain afoot. 
Jenner, one of the rats, is staunchly against Nicodemus's plan to move the rat colony away from the farmhouse to a place called Thorn Valley, where they apparently won't need to steal electricity anymore. He's also just power-hungry in general, and he cuts the rope at just the right time for the resulting collapse to kill Nicodemus. Mrs. Brisby, having broken out of the cage the farmer's boy put her in, returns just in time to tell the rats that Nim is coming, very neatly throwing a very big wrench into Jenner's plans. Which, of course, being a melodramatic villain, he does not take well. Jenner is dealt the final blow by his henchmen, who turned against him in the eleventh hour, and Mrs. Brisby's house, with her children inside, begins to sink into the mud. Devastated and thinking she's lost them, she collapses, but just then the pendant her late husband left her shines brightly and settles around her neck, and with its power she is able to move her house by herself, saving her children. The end of the movie finds Timmy in that period of recovery where you're feeling well enough to be getting bored of resting, but should really still be resting. <laughs> and we learn that Mrs. Brisby gave her amulet to Justin, the captain of the guard, who helped her throughout this journey, who I think is leading the Rats of Nim now. So, all is well in the world. The end. Now, if you know this movie, you might realize I've left someone out. Because I do like this movie, and it is a good one, but it is not perfect. So let's first talk about Jeremy the Crow, who is the tonally dissonant filler character of this movie. The only real important role he plays in it is bringing Mrs. Brisby to the Great Owl at the very start. After that, every single one of his appearances is entirely unnecessary. His defining character trait is being lovelorn, and at the end of the movie, his presumably new girlfriend literally just flies into him from off-screen. She doesn't even get a name, she's just one of those, oh shit, we need to give this guy a girlfriend, non-characters. As I said to my friend after I finished watching this movie, I like it, I just don't like Jeremy. It seems to have been a thing back then, especially in children's animation, where movies just had to cram in some filler, maybe because they had to meet some minute quota, maybe because the higher-ups demanded something akin to comic relief, though I've gotta tell you, this guy did not make me laugh once. I thought when he told the children where their mother had gone after she expressly asked him not to, that that might lead to them trying to make the trip to the rosebush, but no. He is literally just useless after the first, what, 15 minutes? He repaid his debt to Mrs. Brisby for her saving him from Dragon when they met by taking her to the Great Owl. He could very easily just have ducked gracefully out of the movie there. I'm also very cognizant of the fact that while Mrs. Brisby is certainly a strong character in her own right, she spends her entire time on screen being defined by her relationship to her dead husband, to the point that we don't ever even learn her first name. There's also a very weird kind of eugenics-like angle to the Rats of Nim and their relationship to other animals, calling them lower animals and condemning their way of life saying they lived like rats profiting off of man's work, like that's not just the natural way for city rats to live, like it's a moral failing rather than animal instinct. Also, stealing to survive is not wrong. And that's my hot take of the day. I don't usually trouble myself too much with movies like this when they anthropomorphize animals, because in my mind there's a very clear delineation between real-life animals and these ones, but in this film, the line is weird and blurry, because the rats of Nim were normal rats before they were experimented on, but the normal animals, like Jeremy and Mrs. Brisby and Aunt Shrew, all speak to each other, and some of them wear clothes, and Mrs. Brisby even learned to read a little from Jonathan. Aunt Shrew knows how to tie knots well enough to wrap Jeremy up from head to toe. It's very weird, and it's a detail that doesn't quite sit right with me. Also, side note, but I want you all to know that when I was taking down notes during my rewatch, one of them is just rat Christianity. Because apparently, part of becoming more intelligent creatures capable of reading and harnessing electricity is finding rat Jesus. I'm also not entirely sure how I feel about the voice acting. It's not 
terrible, exactly. It's definitely old, you can hear that in the quality of the recording, but the entire movie is old, so that's not exactly a mark against it. But the acting itself, especially Mrs. Brisby, has a very weird, breathy quality to it. Thank you once again. Oh, shoo, shoo, shoo. Go on now. Go on. Thank you so much. It definitely took a moment to get used to it, so while it's not horrendous, I'd say it's not the best either. <laughs> but I did say I liked this movie, didn't I? Yes. Yes, I did. First of all, I do actually like the story. One of the first things we ever learn about Mrs. Brisby, aside from the fact that she's a widow, a mother, and her son is sick, is that she's afraid of heights. She faces this fear the first time she goes to visit the Great Owl, in taking that offered ride from Jeremy to get there. But when she gets the amulet that is supposed to be unlocked by someone with a courageous heart, it doesn't immediately begin glowing. It's only when she's faced both Dragon and her own greatest fear by herself that the amulet activated for her in her hour of need. It's a very neat little character arc. This movie also has science and magic standing side by side, without feeling any need to explain how or why. And I do really like that. You don't always have to explain why shit works the way it does. So long as your audience can follow the internal logic of your story, you're doing fine. That's something I feel more and more creators are losing sight of recently. Also, kind of a minor point, but I do appreciate any animated kids movie that has the guts to actually show some blood when relevant. Lastly, what I love most about this movie is the visuals. I am not kidding when I say this thing does not give you a break. Pretty much every unfamiliar environment we visit in this story bucks design tropes. When Mrs. Brisby goes to the Great Owl, his nest is filled with spider webs and the skeletons of old prey. I mean, that's not how owl pellets work, but I'll let it slide just this once. It's not a place you'd think to go for sage advice. It's not the kooky old master's knick-knack covered cabin, or the wise old scholar's library. It's old and dark and dangerous. Because the Great Owl is old and dark and dangerous. At least, from the point of view of a mouse. And then, there's the rose bush that the rats live in. The inside of it looks far more like the lair of an evil sorcerer than any kind of sanctuary. Indeed, Nicodemus himself looks much more akin to a Saruman than a Gandalf. Even this beautiful space only serves to lull the viewer into a false sense of security before Brutus comes swinging in with his shoot-first-ask-questions-never attitude to intruders. This movie does a masterful job of placing the viewer right there with Mrs. Brisby. You don't really feel safe until the very end. For the entire duration up until then, you feel like, well, like a mouse in a world that is much larger and stranger than you thought it was. Which brings me back around to the question I had which prompted this rewatch. What is it about this movie that affected me so badly? I think I can safely pin a good portion of the blame on the art. It does a fantastic job of unsettling you. The two things I remember best, though, before I rewatched it were The Great Owl and Nicodemus's death. The Great Owl because he terrified me to my core, and Nicodemus's death because... I'm not sure why. I wasn't scared by it, I think it more... viscerally upset me. I do remember being really sad after the movie was over, and I'm not typically a scared crier, but I remember crying into my mother's shoulder after. Which, yeah, I can see why. Even now, at 22 years old, the ending of the movie tastes unmistakably bittersweet. It's not a flavor I'm used to from children's movies, but I think that's part of what makes this one good. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, consider liking it and maybe subscribing. I will be back here Thursday after next. Bye!